This is the uncut version of my interview with Roger Dudding, the owner of what's genuinely considered to be Europe's largest private car collection. Before we rolled the cameras, Roger was negotiating buying another large load of cars to join his collection that already totals more than 420 cars. Click the banner on the right of this screen to see my complete film of his collection or relax and watch this interview. So, Rouse, I've he read a lot about that car. I've never seen one. Which one? The Rouseton there, the just uh, behind you, the pale blue, metallic mm. blue one. I haven't even seen it yeah, yet. Well, well uh, it's behind us. It's behind it? you, yeah. <laughs> is, that the one you is that the one you bought at the weekend? Yes, yeah. Yeah, have you seen it? I've got to have a look at it. Yeah, we can look at it together. In a right, minute. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I suppose the obvious question is. How on earth did all of this start? What was, what was the thing that, that, that kick-started your, your love of cars? Well, one, I happened to have had a, a technical bent, yeah. and I did study engineering, so I'm a would-be engineer. Um, what really kicked it off, I suppose, was back in 1968, mm. I <clears> was <throat> fortunate enough to buy a Jensen FF, uh, and uh, that, though there were other four-wheel drive cars around, yeah. The Jensen FF was the first car in the world to be four-wheel drive with Maxaret anti-lock brakes. Yeah. So I had that in 1968. Um, then when I started my first business in 1970, when I went on my own, that was the car I was using. So I was the salesman, the lounge cleaner, mm. the chairman. The car had to fulfill lots of uh, functions. And over two or three years, it got rather tired. Yeah. So it needed to be restored. So I, th I think I bought myself a van to drive around after that. So I kept the Jensen such a, such a unique vehicle and those things evolved, I had it totally restored. That probably was the original one, uh, to kick the idea off. Um, and then after that, uh, my, or prior to that, my late father, who was a naval officer all his working life, back in 52, uh, 1952, took delivery of a brand new Morris Minor. And of course, most people don't realize now, but at that time, if you ordered a car, the order delivery time was about four years. And by legislation in the UK, and I don't think that stopped until about 1958, if you bought a new car, by law, you had to keep it for four years to stop trading, as yeah. it were, because we were selling cars for export to help rebuild the economy after World War II. So when father unfortunately died in 1970, uh, my mother said she was going to give father's Morris Minor to my younger sister. No way was that going to happen. <laughs> so I, I bought the sister a car of equivalent value and took possession of dad's Morris Minor. Uh, and the silly story behind that, the old man was of a rank where he had a chauffeur-driven naval car. And the procedure often would be that he'd send mother a telegram to say that he was coming home on leave two or three weeks' time. He was at sea, um, get the car ready for him, which I duly did. The old man would arrive home with his driver, say on a Friday night or something, and then on Saturday, he and mother were going to go and visit his parents or her parents. So I had the little Morris all ready to go out. So we say it started to rain, so the old man would summon his driver back, <laughs> use the naval issue humble hawk, uh, to leave the Morris in the garage so it didn't get wet. And uh, I, I couldn't say, no, without doubt, but I don't think Dad's Morris has been in the rain three times in its life. Wow. It is absolutely immaculate. Yeah. Uh, so that really was number two in the collection. Yeah. So is it, is it safe to say if you had to get one car out of the collection, let's say, heaven forbid, the place is on fire, that would be the car you Without saved. question, yeah. yes. And to me, obviously it's emotional, but to me it is, it's you know, priceless. Yeah. And uh, I suppose the, the genuine value of that sort of car today and they're rather cute, the Morris Minor, is probably in the category of five or six thousand yeah. pound. But, but to you, it's, it's priceless. It's, it's, it's priceless, yeah. as you say, yeah. it's priceless. Yeah. I have noticed there are a lot of Jensen's here. Is that a brand that you particularly like? Yeah, I, I think the Jensen is a very unique motor car uh, and it, it's been going on for donkey's years. Mm. And uh, there's, they, they kicked off around about the late 20s. And we have one or two of the historic Jensen's. And then, of course, it evolved into what most people recognise the Jensen as with that big, enormous rear glass yeah. window, which really is the boot lid. Mm. Um, 
but they're so unique. Um, so apart from that, the, the rarer ones are four-wheel drive. Uh, sorry, they're all four-wheel drive, but the rarer ones have the anti-lock braking system. Yeah. And also in the collection, we have a, a convertible, which is a, a rather another unique Jensen motor mm. car. Yeah. yeah. So how does it work then? Do you just <coughs> uh, buy anything that you particularly like? Well, within broad limitations, if I can afford it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm aware, shall we say, serious collectors, uh, perhaps aspire to collect uh, an Aston Martin or Fuaris or something of that ilk. That's all very well and good. But when you've seen one, fundamentally, you've seen them all, mm. you know, to a large degree. So I have absolutely no policy other than finance. So if I go to a car sale, a car auction, and I see something out of the ordinary, and it appeals to me, and I can afford it, I've bought it. Yeah. So uh, I suppose the rude ones amongst my friends and colleagues will say, Dudding, you have an absolute you know, rat bag collection. Um, polite people say, it's eclectic. So um, with, our <coughs> with our visitors to these premises, uh, they're always amazed what we got tucked around the corner. You know, it's a, it's a bizarre collection of motor vehicles. We cover from 1904, uh, which is the oldest vehicle we've got, right up to a, a now a year old Wraith, um, which was built uh, especially to the order of the uh, late uh, Lady Martin, mm -hmm. the widow of George Martin yeah. of uh, Beatles. Beatles fame. Yeah. And he died, uh, Sir George died, I think now about five years ago. Uh, Lady Martin commissioned a Wraith, uh, Rolls Royce Wraith, that's a two-door sport coupe, coupe. Um, in her husband's memory. And it's absolutely beautiful, uh, all copper interior. All the songs he wrote are embroidered in the upholstery, and it's a special paint job. It rather is exceptional. And because of my ex-naval days, and my father uh, being Navy all his career, and then the Fleet Air Arm, and Sir George Martin was also in the Fleet Air Arm, at the end of WW2. That's led me to having a connection with what's called Fly Navy Heritage Trust, which is an entity created to maintain World War I and World War II uh, fleet air arm aeroplanes. So uh, with my current lady in my life, I became a widow seven years ago, uh, so I have another lady these days. Um, we went to Kensington Palace uh, for an auction because Lady Martin, this car was completed, and she decided she'd sell it, brand new, about 100 miles on the odometer, and uh, with, in conjunction with Rolls-Royce, the entire proceeds of the sale would go to the Fly Navy Heritage That's Trust. Yeah. So because of my naval connections and Sir, the late Sir George's naval connections, uh, we went mad and we bought it. And uh, this was about last November time, and uh, we loaned it to Bewley hmm. for about three months. So the connection with uh, the Beatles, Beatles fame, music, but it's quite, quite unique. And with Sir George Martin's name engraved on the door sills, around the spirit of ecstasy, hmm. it's, it is an exquisite motor car. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. <clears throat> so do you actually view this as a car collection? Just do you view it as just your garage? <sighs> I suppose, really, it's got to get into a car collection now. Um, <laughs> it's so varied. It's so, it's so large as well, isn't it? Well, this also led us in, excuse me, <coughs> big one. Um, this also led us into, you know, establishing a high, secure premises, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it's morphed into the situation where we have a number of sometimes friends, people we knew, who wanted us to store their cars mm. for them. We've now evolved it into that, into a business. We now store probably well in excess of 400 cars for high net worth individuals. So a couple of years ago, we commissioned and built a purpose-built storage facility a couple of miles from this building uh, with all bells and whistles on it. And it's an Aladdin's cavern. Obviously, these cars are there under non-disclosure clauses. People can't look at it, but we keep about two thirds of our collection there as well yeah. on different floors. Yeah. So tell me about the ticket machine. The ticket machine? Yes. Oh, well, I had an injury when I was an apprentice in the Navy. Uh, the Navy got rid of me. Uh, I had to join the CD World of Commerce. Uh, so I became a salesman. Uh, at, I joined one company, but then I joined in a big American group. 
and we were selling capital plant around the world. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Scandinavia. In fact, they rented a house for me in a place called Liedinger, the residential suburb of Stockholm. And because I was living in a house and friendly for myself, uh, one needed to go to the you know, various shops to buy food. And typically in a conditori, a uh, cake shop, they had this system where you took fundamentally a, a wooden or a plastic disc with a number on it. Mm. And uh, the shopkeeper would then look at the disc behind him hanging on the wall, uh, which said, for example, you know, 55. They'd call out 56, and whoever got 56 would hand it over to the shopkeeper yeah. and be served. And I thought, taking account Sweden, a clinically clean country, uh, and my late wife always accused me of being Howard Hughes and liking <laughs> cleanliness. I inquired, perhaps rather cheekily, of the retailer um, how frequently these desks were washed. Uh, thinking, for example, that if somebody got some horrible disease, it's being recycled. Mm. Uh, and of course, they were never cleaned, mm. or very rarely. So I thought a one way ticket would be much more hygienic. So if mm. you took fundamentally what would be a raffle ticket, yeah, yeah. then they could call that number out. So that evolved into making a display, so the number could be displayed, and that's where the ticket system started. And so I launched that as a business under the name of Lonsto, an anagram of London and Stockholm, Lonsto. Oh, wow, yeah. That's why I created the name. Yeah. And we sold into banks, because they hardly exist these days, uh, Greenshield Trading Scam Company, which doesn't exist, was in every branch they had, uh, a vast number into retailers like the supermarkets on delicatessen encounters, very high profile clients to this day are still people like Harrods and mm. Selfridges and their food hall. And we're just about every embassy in the country and uh, hospital in waiting rooms. So that's also evolved into different, different areas of business. It really is the simplest ideas, isn't it? Well, I've only got a simple brain, so I can only think of simple <laughs> ideas. So no, no, no question about that, no question. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, w w w when it comes to the, uh, the future of the car, does it fill you with, with dread, the idea of us running around in autonomous cars and electric cars and hydrogen cars and flying cars? cars yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it does to a degree, but this is evolution. And if you go back into history and you think that uh, you know, people will you know, rode across the Thames for about a penny, you know, 250 years ago, then a bridge was built, so the oarsman lost his job because uh, people would use the bridge rather than go in the, in the boat. And then, of course, the uh, uh, hackney carriage mm. business of the horse and the coach, uh, that went out of business because the beginning of the motor car. Yeah. And so it is a process of evolution. And whilst I think one of the greatest things with certain cars, um, apart from the design of the car, and the appearance of the car, if you like motor cars, particularly uh, exquisite sports cars, it is that exhaust note which gives a thrill, tends to you know, tingle up your spine. Yeah. And I must admit, on more than one occasion, I've gone through a tunnel, thoroughly enjoyed the exhaust resonance. I've turned around the other end and gone back again to listen. <laughs> listen. You're not the only one. <laughs> <There was. laughs> so, you know, uh, and it'd be sad for. That, that to go with, a, with an EV, with an electrical vehicle. However, uh, some few months ago, we had a recording company here who were recording the various exhaust notes. Wow. And the idea is that if you now, well, it's happened actually yet, I don't know, but the idea is if you buy an electric car, hmm. you can denote what exhaust notes you want with it. So you can throw a switch and you can have a, a Jaguar or a Ferrari or something roaring away <laughs> at the back, you know. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's just a change. Yeah. But as you say, the evolution into electric cars and you know, possibly hydrogen is around the corner. Mm. Uh, but again, it's, it's quite interesting. People do bang on about electric cars being a brand new thing. Uh, don't quote me on this. I might have it largely wrong. But back in 1904, 1904, 1906, there were more electric propelled cars on the road in America than there were petrol driven cars, mm. uh, which is quite remarkable. Yeah. So 
History's repeating itself. It's not a new thing, is it? And not a new thing. But you can see, walking around the collection here, you've, you've done well in terms of trying to chart the development of the car. You can see there are cars that were brilliant at, the, at that particular moment in time. And it's, it's a great sort of cross-section of, 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 of the motor car, really. We've, we've tried to get a representative selection here. And one particular car I'm terribly fond of is the Aston Martin Lagonda, nicknamed the Wedge. Yes, uh, I was going to ask you about this. Because <laughs> it's bordering on insanity, your totally, collection. <laughs> t totally. And the, the late William Towns uh, designed the Wedge, uh, Aston or Lagonda motor car. And it wasn't uh, a, 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 an evolution of existing car. It was a total, absolute mm. radical design. And in fairness, you'd call it the ultimate Marmite car. Mm. You either loved it or you hated it. Well, I was fortunate enough to uh, buy one back in 81. And I remember driving home, very proud of my Lagonda wedge. Arrived home and my late wife took one look at it and said, that's horrible. It's got to go. <laughs> um, so I managed to persuade her to allow me to keep the car. And they were very, very advanced for their, their time and a lot of electronic problems. And uh, it used to get us to our destination, talking about the UK. And even though we arrived at our destination, I'd pat it on its bonnet and say, thank you very much. When we came out of a friend's home or something, wherever we were to return home, the wretched vehicle wouldn't start. <laughs> so on the third occasion, Gloria said to me, divorce or the car goes. So it was cheaper to get rid of the car. Um, <laughs> But since then, I have amassed another 23 wedge gondas, which of course Roger. is mad. It's yeah. mad. It's really mad. Well, it, it, it is said in the motoring world, if you have one wedge, you're, you're, you're mad. If you have two, you're absolutely bonkers. Uh, so with 23, I'm obviously very certifiable. Yes, you need a straight jacket. Don't straight you? jacket, yeah. take me away now, as it were. Yeah. So is, is it the fact that that car, it was so advanced and it didn't try to copy anything else, and subsequently no other car manufacturers tried to copy it. Is, for you, is that what's so wonderful about it? Yes, it is totally, totally original. Um, as you so correctly say, it was a brand new concept, a brand new design. No one had done it before. No one's done it since. Mm. Uh, most vehicles, are, say, are an evolution. And it's still, you know, it's, it's the sort of car that if you drive it you know, around Mayfair, as an example, there'll be a proliferation of beautiful Rolls or Bentley or Ferraris or Maserati, Jaguars, what have you going around. And yeah, you've seen one, you see them all. Take our wedge down to, uh, down to Mayfair, you know, the high net worth part of London, and traffic stops. People gawp at it, you know, and, and, and they were being built in the late 70s. And we're doing the, uh, having the collection, the very last one made, uh, in actual fact, which is absolutely wonderful. Mm. Um, we resolve quite a few of the electronic faults on it, which is amazing because if you should, for any reason, uh, take the dashboard out of a wedge and look on the back of it, there's this absolute proliferation of wires and printed circuit boards and what have you. And either end is soldered about an inch high little rocket ship. Right. When I first saw that, why? Yeah. Why there's a rocket ship on the printed circuit board of the Wedge Electronics, the Lagonda Electronics. I discovered that most of the electronics were designed and built in Palo Alto, in California, oh, right. yeah. where the rockets are. Yeah. And you think to yourself, well, you know, America can put man on the moon and send rockets upwards and back, but somehow or other they couldn't resolve certain minor uh, electronic faults on the, on the Wedge dash. So, um when are you going to stop buying Lagondas? Is that, is, is that it now? Or if one pops up again, can you not resist the urge? You are right on the button. <laughs> I was offered another wedge <laughs> yesterday. Oh, no. <laughs> and I've, and I, I haven't told my general manager here this yet. And I put an offer in on it. Right. So we'll, we'll put, we, ha we had 24 in the collection at one time. And then uh, a client of ours who's a nut on Aston Martins, he pleaded with me to sell him a wedge to complete his lineup of yeah. Aston Martins and Lagonda. So I sold him one mm. uh, on the condition that he had to maintain it. And if ever in the future he came to sell it, he had to sell it back to me mm. and a story. So we had our collection of 24 reduced to 23. Uh, I had a 
an acquaintance of acquaintance only contacted me yesterday and said they have got this fully restored Mark IV, which is the last of the series, wedge. They want Y number of pounds for it. It's allegedly immaculate, etc. So I've gone back with an offer of 10% of Y number of pounds and whether they accept it or not. Um, I think they possibly will because you have to be a bit of a lunatic to buy them. Y you could say that, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so my, fin my final question is, and it's, I know the answer to this, but when are you going to stop buying cars? I I are you ever going to stop or is the itch irresistible to scratch? I, I, I think that expression is very true. The, the itch is irrespective, uh, ir 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 difficult to, um, to scratch. I, mean, I thoroughly enjoy you know, classic motor cars, looking at them. Thoroughly enjoy the people involved with the classic car industry. Uh, and as we mentioned a little earlier on, you know, the, the, the person who has religiously saved, shall we say, £50 a month out of their net tax income, and let's face it, £50 is still an appreciable sum of yeah. money by most people's standards. That's how much I get paid a month. Well, bless yeah. you, it's, it's <laughs> twice what I get. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they've, they've, they've amassed, shall we say, a couple of thousand pounds or something, and they go and buy often the ubiquitous uh, you know, Triumph Herald, which is a beautiful, beautiful yeah. design to make. And you can buy a nice one for about two, two and a half thousand pounds. Um, but their enthusiasm or their motor car, which has taken them a long time to save up and buy, is probably equal to or more so than certain of our value clients, uh, where we've got a Bugatti Veyron with a value of about four or five million or something mm. similar. Because if you're in that league and you spend, you know, shall we say north of half a million pound, um, well then you can spend that twice as a general guideline. So uh, I, I think because of the wide variety of cars that are on the market, we particularly concentrate on you know, British and European cars, no, a lot come out of a barn, and we see that, and only last week uh, I, I added about another 10 uh, to, to the collection, which I think it puts our collection up to something around about, and I honestly don't know, it sounds awful, but about 460-odd cars we have, as well right. as about 60 bikes, motorbikes. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, I, I think all the time, you know, God willing, I'll have my strength. Yeah. Um, we'll keep on buying, and I'm now talking with our... Uh, solicitors and accountants uh, aiming to put the whole lot into a trust so when Anno Domini decides to take me away um, the collection won't be broken up because as you mentioned just now uh, with the advent of electric vehicles and all the restrictions and controls etc etc I think this is the virtually the last period we will see motor vehicles certainly if somebody of my age can identify with and with total respect you know your age mm. but your children if you have children or you know etc mm. etc they will it won't or possibly won't have the aspiration to own a motor car because individually it'd be so expensive therefore they will hire a car when they need a car so they will either hire a two-seater sports car or a family wagon, or whatever the case may be. And after, you know, hire for a week or two weeks, you send it back. Yeah. And I've seen that already with, uh, with my daughter, who lives in Putney, uh, and has three children. Uh, they have their own car, but they, a little battle bus, they call it, but they very rarely use it. Mm. They use public transport. Uh, they, I mean, people who live in the country would need a car more than people who live in town. But the cost of owning the car, insuring it, taxing it, maintaining it, parking it, um, has become disproportionately expensive. Yeah. And you've got the higher situations moving in a big way. Certainly people in my age bracket, you aspired to own, shall we say, the ultimate, which was a Rolls Royce. That was the pinnacle, that was the aim. Um, I promised myself I'd have one the time I was 35. Uh, it, it turned out, I think I was 37. Uh, I bought the freehold of a property I've in between. I've got a few years to go, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, so I, I wanted, I'd like to keep this collection together. So in 50 years or 100 years, you know, my great, great children can wander around and everybody else's children or grandchildren will say, this is what they had in the 1900s, you know, 1910s, 1920s, 50s, so on and so forth. And this, rat bag collection we've got, <laughs> uh, I think identifies 
what we tried to achieve is all those eras yeah. of, of, of motoring. Yeah. I think you've achieved it. And thank you very much for letting me walk around today. It's been an absolute My pleasure. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Can you sell me a Jaguar E-Type? Of course. We've got, well, I think we have about 10 in the uh, collection. Of course we? you have. We'll have to <laughs> say. <laughs> very thank nice you, Roger. to meet you. Thank, thank you. you.